And we're back at the Critical Connections live desk. If you're just joining us, that was Dr. Buckman speaking with one of the authors from the late breaking session happening later today. We won't be broadcasting that session live, but you can read Dr. Badawi's fa fascinating article in Critical Care Medicine. You can view the article at sccm.org slash literature, where it is available for free, along with all of the late-breaking research articles here at Congress. This includes articles from SCCM's journals, as well as the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, and Lancet. It is now time to cover the first live broadcast of the day, Bioelectric Medicine, a Jumpstart in Critical Illness. Stay tuned. It's great to be here this morning, and what I'd like to do in the next uh, few minutes is talk to you about an intersection of two fields that don't intersect very well, but the implications of the intersections of neuroscience with immunology are going to be profound for the future of intensive care medicine. What I'd like to leave you with is the idea that in the future it'll be possible and we are doing already, the decoding of the individual nerves that control specific components of the immune system. And in doing this, once you decode the information in the nerves, like a submarine listening to a telephone call on a transatlantic cable, it becomes possible to re-encode the signals. And by mapping these signals onto first the immune system and then other physiological responses, it's possible today to design devices that can read write these systems that are going to have, as I said, tremendous implications for the future of critical care. I'm a neurosurgeon. I've been fascinated by inflammation, as you heard from Dr. Buckman, for 30 years. And it's an, an unusual combination of careers, if you will. And it happened, um, in my case, by accident. I was training as a neurosurgeon at Cornell at the New York Hospital, and I was caring for a, a little girl named Janice. She was 11 months old and had crawled across the kitchen floor as her grandmother was cooking dinner. Grandma turned to drain a pot of boiling water from the stove and tripped on the baby and spilled the boiling water on her granddaughter. So when I met Janice in the emergency room of the New York Hospital, she was scalded over 75% of her body. Uh, death sentence. We cared for her for a month, multiple skin grafts, multiple bouts of sepsis, on and off the ventilator, on and off renal dialysis, and miraculously she survived. She did brilliantly well. And, and, and we were considering, talking about, sending her home. And that same day I was standing in the doorway to her room and she was drinking out of a baby bottle her lunch and she rolled her eyes back and died. I ran in the room put her in my left arm, gave her mouth to mouth, pushed on her heart with my right index finger, and the code went on and on for hours, and it was no use, she was gone. And it was, it was horrible. It was life-changing for me. It was horrible because it was so sad and she was so innocent, and it was horrible because there was no reason to explain why she died. At the, the, at the time, we quote-unquote knew that Acute shock in this situation was caused by endotoxins and bacterial toxins, but we found no evidence of infection or toxins in her body. And so the question, obviously, was what was the toxin that killed Janice? So I had scheduled with Dr. Shires to begin research in Steve Lowry's laboratory in 1985, and I decided then and there to begin working on this problem of shock and inflammation, and I'm still working on it today. And what we discovered collaborating with Tony Cerami at Rockefeller, was that the molecule that killed Janus was TNF. And TNF is made by the immune system, not by the bacteria. And that when it's overproduced in large amounts, it becomes very, very lethal. And we showed in a series of papers that TNF was sufficient to cause shock and tissue injury. TNF was sufficient to cause inflammation in the absence of bacteria. The question next was, is it necessary? And to do those experiments, we developed a monoclonal anti-TNF antibody. And this paper in Nature in 1987 with Steve and Tony was the first description of the therapeutic use of monoclonal anti-TNF. 
And what we did is we, we took bad bones and infused them with replicating E. coli, causing them to make their own TNF and die. We then took the monoclonal antibody and treated separate groups of baboons to block the TNF. And those animals lived. And they didn't go into shock. So the upper two lines are animals that received bacteria and anti-TNF. And the lower line is an animal that received bacteria without anti-TNF. And this is blood pressure. And of course, monoclonal anti-TNF blocked death and blocked acute shock. This was the first description of the therapeutic use of monoclonal anti-TNF antibodies. This paper has been cited thousands of times. And it became the basis of drugs that you know today as Enbrel and Remicade and other monoclonal antibodies that represent 5% of the global pharmaceutical industry receipts for drug sales and growing. $50 billion a year target antibodies against cytokines to block inflammation. The basis for this idea I call the cytokine theory of disease. The cytokine theory of disease does not say that all cytokines are bad, just like the germ theory doesn't say that all germs are bad. The cytokine theory of disease says that in some situations, cytokines are both necessary and sufficient to cause the major signs and symptoms of disease. Evolutionary pressure over millions of years put checks and balances on cytokine production to shift the balance towards health. And what we've done today now, using monoclonal antibodies to target specific cytokines based on the cytokine theory of disease, is prevent the toxicity of endogenous cytokines. Now, thinking about this, the place designated between cytokines and disease is a critical engineering checkpoint. And evolutionary pressure would have exerted significant influence on the control of cytokine activity at that checkpoint. There's tremendous evolutionary pressure on the off switch when inherent molecules to the body have toxic profiles that can be modulated. I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes. When I moved to the Feinstein Institute in 1992, I set up a laboratory looking at molecules to block cytokines that were not monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies, as good as they are, are far from perfect. They have toxicity. Some monoclonal antibodies have black box warnings. They're very expensive. They have to be injected. And they only work in about half the patients. I was interested in developing a small molecule that would block TNF. And it's a much longer story I won't tell today, but the lead molecule in this exercise when we began, we named CNI-1493. And it's shown here. It's a tetravalent guanyl hydrazone, and it's a very good inhibitor of TNF. And we made it based on arginine metabolism, and we could talk about that afterwards, those of you who are interested. And the original name was actually 1492, because it was the 14th molecule we identified in a screen of several hundred molecules in 1992. But we didn't want to do 1492, because that's when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and we didn't want to be telling that joke for 20 years. So we changed it to 1493. We worked on this molecule for many, many years. And we found that in dozens of diseases, animal models of disease, of high levels of TNF, when you put in CNI-1493, it blocked the TNF very well. We published dozens of papers. We did two clinical trials. It was quite good at blocking TNF production in humans receiving IL-2 infusion for cancer therapy. And it was quite good at blocking TNF production in Crohn's disease patients. So we knew quite a bit about it. And uh, we weren't really ready for the surprise that occurred next. It was a big surprise. We were studying this molecule in the brains of animals with a stroke. So we would induce a cerebral infarction in a mouse or a rat, which would drive up the TNF production, and then put the drug in the brain to look at the effects of the drug in the brain blocking the TNF in the brain. And what we found was shocking. We, 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 we put the drug in the brain. And it turned off the TNF in the brain. That's what we expected. But it also turns it off in the lungs, in the liver, in the spleen, in the gut, in the kidneys, 
And this made no sense whatsoever. How the heck could a few picograms of molecule in the brain turn off the production of TNF in the body's major organs? So we worked on this for many, many months. We went to the literature, could find nothing. Took out the pituitary gland, same effect. And then one day, we cut the vagus nerve and repeated the experiment. And when we, when we did this, what we discovered was that if the vagus nerve was cut, CNI-1493 in the brain no longer turned off the TNF production in the body. This meant that the brain was sending signals, like a break, to turn off TNF in the body, and those signals were traveling in the vagus nerve. Now, we knew that the vagus nerve was functioning like an electrical conduit, but we had no idea on the origin of the signal in the brain or the termination of the signal in the immune system. This was all we could find in the literature went back centuries. So the vagus nerve is a very important nerve, drawn here by Vesalius in the 16th century, touching pretty much all the body's organs. It's not a solid copper wire. It's more like 100,000 insulated wires with individual roles and targets. And these individual roles encompass the physiological control of all of the organ systems that most people, I'm in an intensive care meeting, so you all think about this every day, but most people don't think about the effects on heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, insulin secretion, and GI function, and the list is much longer. The vagus nerve is a principal conduit. It's 80% sensory. So it's a principal conduit for sending information into the brain to be processed that elicit reflex responses to maintain physiological homeostasis across a range of changes in the body's environment. Searching hard, what we never could find on the list was the immune system. So we postulated that if the vagus nerve was controlling TNF in the body, maybe we had come across the motor arm of a reflex. And to prove that, we used electrical stimulation of the vagus nerve to measure TNF in rats. Here we're using electrons, if you will, instead of anti-TNF. So Ludmila, postdoc in the lab, Ludmila Borovakova, took animals and gave them endotoxin. And in the second bar, the open bar, you see that the animals make a lot of TNF. But when she cut the vagus nerve in the third bar, they made even more TNF because they cut the brake lines on the car going down the hill. When she electrically stimulated the vagus nerve in the fourth bar, TNF was blocked. And, and what, this is the very first experiment. This was published in Nature in 2000. And what you're seeing is the blockade of TNF does not go to zero. Monoclonal antibodies are immunosuppressive because they block 100% of the target. This highly conserved evolutionary reflex to control the immune system doesn't block to zero. There would be no evolutionary gain for immunosuppressing the host. And as you'd expect, uh, if you look at blood pressure in these animals, the middle line shows the hypotension that occurs in response to endotoxin because the animals make too much TNF. If you cut the vagus nerve, the animals go into shock more quickly on the far left line. And if you electrically stimulate the vagus nerve of these animals, they're protected from shock. So this was, this was tremendously exciting. And thinking about the motor arc of a reflex to block TNF caused us to go back and once again search the li literature for any evidence of a sensory arc. Because I knew as a neurosurgeon, tapping reflexes in my office and watching brainstem reflexes in the ICU and in the OR, that reflexes like this, this motor reflex, don't occur de novo. These motor signals occur in response to a change in the environment, which is mediated by signals traveling in the sensory arc of the nervous system. Going back to the literature, I came across a paper which had virtually almost never been cited at the time from Linda Watkins. And what Linda showed here is that the vagus nerve was transmitting information to the brain about the presence of IL-1 in the abdomen. 
So what she did is she injected rats with IL-1 and the red line that caused them to have a fever because, because IL-1 is a potent pyrogen. But when she cut the vagus nerve in yellow, she blocked the development of fever. This meant that the vagus nerve was the information conduit telling the brain that IL-1 was there to activate the fever response. So I sat down and sketched out what I called the inflammatory reflex as a model. And that information traveling up the vagus nerve about IL-1 or other inflammatory signals would be processed and activate a motor reflex which would travel back down to the immune system to counteract the overproduction of cytokines. We've worked on this for 20 years. I counted it up. It's about 500,000 hours of human labor in my lab and $25 million. And what we understand is that these signals traveling up and down the vagus nerve are electrical in nature and can be decoded and that they culminate, in the case of the inflammatory reflex, they culminate in the spleen. Now, the inflammatory reflex is the prototype. In the next 10 or 20 years, I predict there will be dozens of reflexes mapped to dozens of discrete immunological endpoints that can be modulated by electrons. But for now, I've focused on the mechanisms of the inflammatory reflex. And obviously, I'm not going to summarize 20 years of work. You'd all get up and leave. But I will show you a couple of things that are really cool. The first is that the signals traveling down the vagus nerve to the spleen don't control the cells in the spleen that make TNF directly. They actually have an intermediate cell. The, sig the neural signals are processed in the spleen by a T cell, a T cell subset. So this is work done by Mauricio Rosas Bellina and Peter Olison as co-first authors. And what, what we show in this paper is that you're seeing in orange a splenic nerve ending, which utilizes norepinephrine as the neurotransmitter. That nerve ending is under the control of the vagus nerve signals coming down from the brain stem. The nerves in the spleen control the T cell, and that T cell is green because it makes acetylcholine. We've attached a GFP, a green fluorescent protein, to the transcriptional controller downstream of choline acetyltransferase, the rate-limiting enzyme in the biosynthesis of acetylcholine. So electrical signals arising in the brainstem travel to the spleen, and we can look at the specific cells that make the acetylcholine that in, turns that in turn turns off the TNF in the spleen. So it looks something like this. The signals come down the vagus nerve into the splenic nerve. And inside the splenic nerve, norepinephrine is released by the splenic nerve endings. Norepinephrine interacts with T cells, which respond by making acetylcholine. The acetylcholine interacts with the macrophages that make TNF. And the acetylcholine, signaling through nicotinic alpha-7 acetylcholine receptors, turns off the inflammatory response in the macrophage. That's 20 years of work and 500,000 person hours. That's pretty good for 20 seconds, huh? <laughs> now we had the opportunity to try to help patients. I sketched on the back of a napkin in the early 90s the idea of taking an electron producing device, a nerve stimulator, putting it on the vagus nerve of patients, and turning on the device to see if it would block TNF in the organs. The idea would be to use electrons to replace monoclonal antibodies. And, and, and the idea is based on the mechanistic understanding we have today of this crucial evolutionarily conserved checkpoint on the cytokine theory of disease. And the idea would be to use electrons to target that point to turn off cytokines. Now, at the time, by the, by the mid-1990s, anti-TNF had already been clinically approved for patients with rheumatoid arthritis and for patients with Crohn's disease and then later ulcerative colitis. And so the original idea of starting a company called Setpoint Medical was to do the clinical trial and see if we could block cytokines in humans with these diseases 
and treat them. We published the trial in um, July of 2016. And I'll show you what happened. So rheumatoid arthritis, I don't have to tell this audience, is a devastating disease. The pathogenesis is in part driven by the production of a panis or an inflammatory tissue mass, which is almost like a tumor in joints. And this growth of this destructive panis is stimulated by cytokines like TNF and IL-1 and IL-6, which is why those antibodies are clinically approved for rheumatoid arthritis today. What we did in the trial, which was led by Paul Peter Tack, one of the world's leading rheumatologists from Amsterdam, AMC, and by then Ralph Zicknick and now David Chernoff, the chief medical officers at Setpoint, is we used an off-the-shelf device from Cyberonics, which is implanted under the collarbone and a lead is tunneled up to the chest to send electrons into the vagus nerve. Now, very importantly, the engineers had to reprogram this device because we learned from all that work in the lab that you only have to stimulate the nerve for a few minutes a day to block cytokine production for many hours. And we could talk about the mechanisms for that, but it actually is not as surprising as it seems because acetylcholine pushes M1 macrophages to differentiate into M2 macrophages, which are tissue protective and not inflammatory. So you actually have a half-life that's based on cell turnover of the macrophages in response to a very short pulse of, of electrical information. Now, the Cyberonics device is programmed to be five minutes on, five minutes off all day long, and the Cyberonics settings for epilepsy are very high current and voltage. We dialed all those way down because we also showed that the nerves to the spleen require only 500 microamps of current to be stimulated as opposed to 5 milliamps. So although this study used a device that's cuffed on the vagus nerve, we have both selectivity and time specificity to the response. So patients received an implant in Amsterdam, the, uh, Amsterdam in um, Bosnia and in Croatia. These are patients with severe rheumatoid arthritis. And we started with patients in New York. These are epilepsy patients. And the first question we had is, will this work if the patient's asleep? So we used patients who were having the device put in to treat epilepsy. And what you can see, what you're looking at is pre-anesthesia levels of whole blood TNF production. And then post-anesthesia levels in the second column of whole blood TNF production. And then we turn the device on and within four hours, the whole blood TNF production was significantly decreased. These people are asleep under general anesthesia. This is not the placebo effect. These people look like all the animals in the lab. And in fact, the same holds true for the mechanistic understanding we have that the alpha-7 control downregulates IL-1 and IL-6 in the lab and in those same patients. I didn't talk about it, I won't talk about it, but Alpha-7 is very important in inhibiting the activity of the inflammasome. So you see inhibition of IL-1 and HMG and many other cytokines. So knowing now that we could inhibit the cytokines in humans under anesthesia, we moved to the patients in Amsterdam and in uh, Bosnia and in Croatia. And the results were striking. So the um, bottom most line are a cohort of patients, seven patients, who uh, failed methotrexate and steroids. These were mostly in Bosnia and Croatia where they, don't have any, they didn't have access to monoclonals. You're looking at a change in DAS28 CRP score. This is the clinical measure of rheumatoid arthritis severity, which is used in the assessment and approval of rheumatoid arthritis drugs. This is a big effect. And when the device was implanted and turned on, you see there's a fairly rapid response within a couple of weeks in that first group. And then at day 42, it says treatment hiatus. That's because we turned it off. And soon after turning it off, you can see the patients got worse. I will tell you that when we turned it back on on day, 40, on day 56, they started to get better. And just uh, last month, the follow-up of these patients, now several years, shows that they continue to improve and they stay in stable re remission. 
placebo effects don't last for years. The top line is another interesting group. That's the, co the cohort two, the squares. Those people failed biologics. They, some of them failed multiple biologics. Why would this work in patients with failing monoclonal anti-TNF? Because this also blocks IL-1 and IL-6. Why would this work in patients that failed anti-IL-6? Because it also blocks TNF and IL-1. And we know a lot about cytokines and synergy between cytokines. So it's quite plausible, it's an unproven hypothesis, but it's quite plausible that the therapeutic response in the biologic failures from using the vagus nerve stimulation to block cytokines is because you're interfering with the synergistic effect of multiple cytokines. And that's a statistically significant cohort. And the combined cohort of 17 in the middle curve is also statistically significant. So this was tremendously exciting. Um, I flew to Mostar, Bosnia in the mountains in the west of the country to meet the first patient. And he's shown the tall guy in the middle in the blue sweatshirt. So that's me. I look very happy. I actually look happier than the patient, but he was happy too. I may have been happier than him. I, I had never met I had never met a patient that had benefited from something that my colleagues and I had, had invented. This was one of the most memorable days in my career. To, uh, in the middle of the, to, to the patient to my left, to your right, is, is his physician. Uh, to her side is her boss, the chairman of medicine, and the, the, the professor that trained pretty much all the academics in Bosnia. And the guy on the end is the uh, neurophysiology tech. I asked the patient, did you feel more energy? No. Did you feel, did you gain or lose weight? No. Did you, did you, did anything happen with your, you know, he said, I felt better. I didn't have pain and I felt happier. Now, all the patients in the trials had the option of having the device removed if they didn't respond. And no patient has had the device removed. Because the DAS28 score I showed you includes objective measures of joint count and blood CRP levels. It also includes objective measures, subjective measures of a patient on a, on a hack score. And the patients felt better. So this was, this, was, this was remarkable for many reasons for me. I flew home from that trip and called set point and I resigned from the board. I didn't, and they said, why? We don't want you to resign from the board of your company. You co-founded it. I said, I didn't co-found the company to develop devices and sell them. I, 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 I founded the company to do the clinical trial to see if it would work. And it works. So that, the company continues to do clinical trials. There's one open today. It is an FDA-approved IND now to do this rheumatoid arthritis trial in the US in patients like him who failed methotrexate and patients like this woman that was written about in the New York Times who failed five biologics. She failed five biologics over many, many years. She had devastating rheumatoid arthritis in Amsterdam, and some days she couldn't pick up a pencil. She needed help buttoning her shirt to go to work in the morning. After being implanted in April of 2013, she had a complete remission. She's off her drugs, and she's now bicycling 20 miles a day round trip to the Dutch coast on weekends. This is um, incredibly exciting times. Larger trials are coming now, but for me, these patients look exactly like the mechanistic understanding that we've developed in the lab. Independently, Bruno Bonai in Grenoble, France, has done a Crohn's disease trial. He used the same device. He did not reprogram it, and he implanted patients, seven patients, with severe Crohn's disease. Two of them got worse and exited the study. But five of them had clinical, biological, and endoscopic remission with restored vagal tone. Setpoint has also now done an independent Crohn's disease trial and also showed activity in Crohn's patients. What's remarkable about this is the data you're looking at is endoscopic biopsy scored tissue for the presence of inflammation. So you're not looking at cytokine levels here. You're actually looking in the patients at an improvement of the inflammation in the tissue that's affected by the disease. There'll be a lot more work coming on this too.
I went back to New York and decided to open a center for bioelectronic medicine at the Feinstein Institute at Northwell Health. This is a not-for-profit research center to be the home for the science of bioelectronic medicine for the world in New York. We have committed millions of dollars to this new center based on the process of bioelectronic medicine. Bioelectronic medicine is not the vagus nerve, and it's not vagus nerve stimulation. Bioelectronic medicine is a process. In the pharma industry, the process is you begin from a molecular target, you move to a screen, and you sell the drugs. In bioelectronic medicine, we start with the target and a molecular mechanistic understanding, and then move to mapping neural circuits that can control those targets in situ. Knowing the nerves controlling the target and knowing the target, now you can build devices that are specified to control the nerve, to control the target. It's a replicable, scalable model based on the story of the inflammatory reflex that I told you. Take out TNF and put in a transcription factor for cancer. Find the nerve, build the device, control the transcription factor, see if you help the cancer. The list is very significant of the diseases that are going to be amenable to this. This process of recording neural signals, decoding them, and then re-encoding them is not some distant future dream. It, this is the, the clear and present future. To help run this center, I recruited Chad Boughton from, from, the, from Battelle in Columbus, Ohio. Chad is a world leader in decoding neural signals from the brain. In fact, he wrote the paper in Nature in 2016 of the first quadriplegic patient to be able to regain movement by thinking about it. So what you see here is this is a patient named Ian. He's quadriplegic from a swimming accident. And he has a chip in his brain with 75 electrodes that are recording his thoughts. During the training session, He's asked to think about extending his thumb, flexing his wrist, or extending his wrist. This training session produces these brain recordings that Chad and his colleagues decoded. Having decoded the signals, they, were, they, they then sent the motor, or the descending signals of what the decoded signals mean, back to a cuff that controls the muscles on Ian's hand and arm and wrist. And this is what Ian can do now by thinking about it. He's quadriplegic. That it's unbelievable. And it's already happened. And it's based on fundamental, direct, simple concepts. A training set on what the neural signals are mean or are doing, and then a corresponding motor set to elicit the required response. The inflammatory reflex is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, as I've been talking about today with my colleagues, we've spent the vast majority of our time looking at the descending signals that travel from the brain down through the cytokine axis into the spleen to control cytokine production through molecular mechanisms downstream of alpha-7, all of this is published, to control the cytokine response. But again, as a neurosurgeon, I know that these signals coming down don't start out of thin air. These signals that are the controlling signals to the immune system arise in response to changes in the body's milieu. They, they, they arise in response to specific molecules made by bacteria, viruses, toxins, or cytokines like HMGB1 that activate afferent neural signals. So, so what we wanted to do next, and what we now have dozens of people working on, is decoding the signals elicited by molecules. We want to be like the submarine listening to the telephone calls on the transatlantic cable. We want to use the body, the whole body, as the receptor. 
because the brain knows how much glucose is there and how much sodium is there and how much TNF is there. We want to listen in on what the brain is hearing, which are the sensory signals traveling up the vagus nerve. Let me show you some of the early work that we published on this from Ben Steinberg and Harold Silverman. Ben, Ben's a postdoc now up, up in Toronto. Harold's a graduating graduate student, and Singita Shivan is my, my, my key right-hand person and a uh, professor in the lab with me. You're looking at, on the left, at recordings on the vagus nerve of a mouse using a, an electrode that's looking at all of the electrical activity and using um, computer learning algorithms and ar artificial intelligence algorithms you can actually decode those signals and what you're looking at on the right are compound action potentials per second and you can see everything's fairly quiet this would be baseline when we inject the animal with TNF you get a very different picture TNF causes a very clear electronic signature in the vagus nerve of this mouse. And what's amazing is if you decode those signals, they look very different than IL-1. So the panel B, the mouse's brain is hearing TNF, TNF, TNF. And in panel C, the mouse's brain is hearing IL-1, IL-1, IL-1. We're now in the process of making this a measurable event because we'll be able to develop electronic devices that listen into the nerves and tell you how much TNF is in that patient, and in what organ, and at what time, and for how long, because the brain knows all that. And we can reduce this to discrete molecular mechanisms, because you have to have molecular mechanisms to do this right. What you're looking at here are neurons. These are the cell bodies that would be from the nodose ganglion, which is the home of the sensory cell bodies that travel in the vagus nerve. You can see that some of the neurons, not all, express TNF receptor 1 and 2. And when you expose those neurons to TNF, you get a calcium wave, which means that they're firing action potentials. But if you repeat the experiment in TNF knockout neurons, there's no calcium wave. So the point is, is that you can ask sophisticated electronic decoding questions as long as you pay attention to the underlying molecular biology, number one. And number two, there's 100,000 nerves, fibers in the vagus nerve. And, you only, and, and, and we're only talking about a few at a time. You need 120 to control respiration out of 100,000. You probably only need 50 to control TNF production in the spleen. And the list goes on and on and on. But what used to seem as a daunting task to decode is, is not so daunting with today's sophisticated technology. We're using, for instance, optogenetic nerve stimulation to look at the firing of individual specific neurons. So this is the, bra the basal forebrain cholinergic system of a mouse or a rat. And there's nothing in the literature about this system connecting to the brain stem. But for a number of reasons I can't go into, based on clinical trials and lab work, we knew that this system could control the production of TNF in the spleen. So how could it do that? To answer the question, you, you, we turned to optogenetics. So we, we, we took a laser and point the laser at the brainstem forebrain cholinergic nuclei of a mouse. Only we used special mice. These are mice that the neurons are labeled with channel rhodopsin, which is light sensitive in a narrow range of wavelengths. Now, any neuron that's expressing this protein that gets lasered will fire. We then bred that, that mouse onto mice that express channel rhodopsin under a Cree system. So now we have mice that only cholinergic neurons will express channel rhodopsin. And it's a very small number of neurons. But that means when we shine the laser in that, in that basal forebrain cholinergic system of that mouse, that only the cholinergic neurons will fire. And when Valentin Pavlov, my colleague, a professor in the lab, and uh, Kurt Lerner, grad student, did the experiment, if you don't have channel rhodopsin, the laser does nothing to the TNF in the blood or spleen. But if the mice has channel rhodopsin and you turn the laser on, look what happens. It's amazing. We can, we can, we can target a few neurons in the basal forebrain nuclei of a mouse and block the TNF in the spleen. I'm not proposing optogenetics are going to be in the clinic tomorrow, but there will be a way in the clinic 
in the next few years to do specific neural targets like this that are going to have tremendous implications for ICU patients and ICU care. Another question is how does the signal from the brainstem get to the spleen? So we're answering that. This is work done by Adam Kressel, an MD-PhD student in the lab, and Sangeeta Shivan again. You're looking at the laser that's shining on the brainstem of a mouse pointed at the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve. Now the textbooks say that the vagus nerve doesn't go to the spleen and that the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus nerve doesn't control anything in the spleen. But obviously all of the data I've talked about for the last 40 minutes says that it does go to the spleen. And so to prove that, Adam pointed that laser on the dorsal motor nucleus of a mouse brain stem and put a recording device on the splenic nerve of a mouse. Look what happens. This hasn't been published yet when he turns the laser on. In red, there's a ramp up time as the laser warms up. The splenic nerve starts to fire. He turns it off in red again and it stops. He turns it on, it ramps up, and the, and the splenic nerve is firing. So this is direct proof that the cholinergic neurons arising in the DMV are traveling down the vagus nerve to activate the splenic nerve. That violates a number of textbooks. It, there's a couple of groups in the world who write at least two papers a year saying how foolish, wrong, and incorrect my group and I are because we proposed this, this control mechanism in the spleen. This is further proof that well, we may be crazy, but we're not stupid. The implications for the ICU, I'll say it again, are profound. This is a list of a review I wrote a couple years ago of the diseases for which there's already data. Some data in um, mice, some data in rats and pigs, some data in humans. The diseases that are, uh, that are for which there are active programs to do this include ischemia, hypertension, diabetes, cancer, shock, I showed you paralysis, and transplantation biology. For those of you interested in coming into this field, there's a huge, huge financial interest in this field. I've uh, met with Francis Collins on several occasions. He launched a program called Sparks, which is a several hundred million dollar investment in this space. I've worked with DARPA for many, many years and helped them launch several programs in this space. I met with Bill Gates, who through Intellectual Ventures has invested in Sanguistat, a company the Feinstein Institute has spun out in order to develop devices to stop hemorrhage. The animal data are overwhelming. We're moving to clinical trials this year in patients with postpartum hemorrhage. Bill Gates is interested, if this works in US trials, in deploying this into Africa, where postpartum hemorrhage is a major killer in, the, un, un, in, in, in Africa. We've made major investments at the Feinstein Institute. We work closely with Martine Rothblatt and United Therapeutics on looking at ways of building chips to stop the immune response to transplant rejection and in pulmonary hypertension. We have a huge um, collaboration with GE, looking at the implications for developing electronic vaccines. And GlaxoSmithKline was an early supporter of a multi-center international research consortium that I helped them set up. These are tremendously exciting times. The implication for medical care is now. It's not in 50 years, it's now. The number of devices that are going to be coming online is going to be staggering. And my caution and plea is that we remain focused on molecular mechanisms and stop building devices that are really cool, sticking them in a bunch of patients and turning them on to see what happens, which is what was done for many, many decades. We now have the opportunity, we have the tools, we have the financial backing, and we have the scientific knowledge and technology to build devices that target discrete molecular mechanisms controlled by specific neural circuits to help our patients. Thank you. Welcome back and thank you for joining us here at Critical Connections Live. That was a lot of information to digest and luckily we are joined now by Dr. Tim Buckman to help explain it all. I'll turn it over to you doctors to begin the discussion. Thank you. Dr. Buckman, thank you for being here with us. Uh, before we get started, maybe I could just get you to uh, introduce yourself really quickly. 
editor-in-chief of the journal Critical Care Medicine. I had the privilege of working as a collaborator with Dr. Tracy over the years on many projects. Thank you. Well, that was a fascinating talk. And my first question for you is, you yourself have built a illustrative c career dealing with various manifestations of critical illness. And how are you approaching this potential additional therapeutic option of bioelectronic medicine for critical care? Great question. You know, several years ago, we began to understand that the process of organ dysfunction and organ failure wasn't as much a problem at the cellular level, but rather at the communication level. The release of various mediators, which were brand new in the 1980s, Dr. Tracy mentioned several of them, TNF and IL-1, gave us the idea that somehow if we could modulate the effect of those mediators in sepsis and other critical illnesses, we might improve the trajectories and the outcomes of our patients. All of us remember the issues of those trials. It was sort of like taking a cannonball and trying to hit a very small target. Every one of us who participated in those trials had one or two or three patients who Lazarus-like seemed to rise from the dead. We didn't have the tools at that time to understand what was really going on at the molecular and cellular level. Now let's talk about what Dr. Tracy spoke of today. When I was growing up as a young surgeon, the vagus nerve was thought of pretty much as a copper wire. Uh, you just had a big copper wire there and you either left it alone or you cut it. What Dr. Tracy has told us is that it's not a single copper wire. We could think of it as maybe 100,000 separate copper wires with information traveling up and down at very high rates of speed. And what Dr. Tracy has shown is that he can decode the signals traveling along that cable to understand, to sense, and even to predict the events that are going to occur. Why is that important? Well, today we still pretty much use cannonball approaches. Those patients who are treated for rheumatoid arthritis with anti-TNF, that's a pretty big cannonball approach. And those of us in the ICU know how susceptible those patients are to secondary infections. The technology, the science, the integration into patient care that Dr. Tracy has pioneered promises to be able to target changes in the neurologic signaling, which go on to change what's going on at cellular targets promising at some point in the future that we'll be able to use a combination of bioelectronics and bioinformatics to change the course of our patients. How do you envision us implementing this in this time of great um, economic leanness, let's just say? Well, you know, it's a fascinating observation in almost every area of medicine the cost of new technologies and new drugs has been extraordinary. You may not be young enough to, to, to old enough to remember this, but, but I was certainly old enough to remember the early days of dialysis, introduction of uh, hemodynamic monitoring, uh, the use of these monoclonal antibodies. Uh, all of them came with a very high opportunity cost. But the history of medicine is pretty clear. If something works, we'll figure out a way to do it at higher volume, at lower margin, and to bring the cost down. And we'll also bring the complexity of the intervention down as well. Remember, the early pacemakers were not little implantable batteries with wires that could be put in a cath lab. They were room-sized devices that were necessary to keep the first few patients alive. We're very early on in the trajectory of bioelectronic medicine, but the steps that Dr. Tracy and his colleagues have taken hold enormous promise for what critical care is going to look like in the future. Imagine for a moment if we weren't busying ourselves with making ventilator adjustments, that can be done by closed loop artificial intelligence, but we actually had that type of artificial intelligence to figure out what the traffic is on the Trans-Pacific Cable, 
to decode that traffic, to interrupt that traffic in a way so the messages weren't all unhappy, but were projecting the patient into a space where the patient could recover from their critical illness. Is it going to happen in my clinical lifetime? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it's going to happen in yours. I wanted to follow up on a uh, analogy, well, not analogy, something you brought about the history of critical illness, which is that we've used a bunch of different things that uh, turned out to be cannonball shot, shotgun approaches. Do you feel like this has the potential to be a more specific technique in terms of combating the various inflammatory states? Absolutely. The data that Dr. Tracy showed that he could detect the different signature of neural traffic when the stimulus was TNF versus uh, interleukin-1 or interleukin-6, the fact that he can now listen in on the cable and know what messages are being sent up to the brain promises to allow us to send different messages back down to the target tissues and say, time to turn this on or off. Look, we know that the evolution of critical illness is no longer reasonably conceived of as a series of dominoes falling, but abnormalities in a complex web, a network of signaling. And what Dr. Tracy's work allows us to do is get to the nodes on the network, understand the traffic between the nodes, and then there's the promise of intervening to change that traffic, to change the shape and the structure of that network in real time to the benefit of the patient. I'll be honest with you, when I first saw the TED Med talk and looked online at his stuff, I was not convinced that this was anything other than science fiction. Um, there seemed to be a lot of promise, but not a lot, but I was concerned about the underlying science. After listening to Dr. Tracy's talk for 45 minutes, where he gave a very measured, thoughtful talk on the research and the data that he's done, I was extremely impressed that, uh, that he did that. And I applaud SECM for bringing this kind of research to the providers at the bedside, to all the attendees of, of, of this conference, because I'm not sure that most of us have heard of bioelectronic medicine before. And it's really a, a spectacular, promising new field. Well, thanks so much for that remark. And let's remember the tagline that both of you are wearing on your lapels, <laughs> right care, right now. Our understanding of right care is informed by discovery, by the exploration, uh, the frontiers of science. When I was growing up, uh, I learned five operations to deal with ulcer disease, most of which involved cutting that vagus nerve. But today we understand ulcer disease is the product of a bacterial infection, and maybe that vagus nerve is really important to our health. The Society of Critical Care Medicine, now uh, in its fifth decade of existence, is all about understanding the best way to care for patients and families. And the type of presentation that you heard today, cutting edge science from the people who are doing the best work in the world, is what makes the SCCM annual conference, our annual congress, the very best meeting of the year. That's very inspirational. I wanted to try to extrapolate down the road where this technology uh, is becoming implemented in patient care. How do we ramp up the ability to provide this care to all of our patients rather than just patients in extremely specialized centers, uh, you know, patients who have the financial means to travel to these centers? It's a great question, and that's part of the educational mission. As Dr. Tracy mentioned, there's huge financial interest. Let's face it, this would be a revolutionary therapy. Uh, in order to make it financially viable, it's going to have to be simplified. Now, I happen to have put in uh, the second Hickman catheter ever to be placed uh, at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And boy, that was a, uh, quite an event. You know, you had to do a cut down on the shoulder and find the vein and, you know, free people in the operating room and additional assistance and so forth. Today, putting in an indwelling catheter into the central venous system is something that's done at every small community hospital 
pretty much on the face of the earth. So it's a question of simplifying the technology, reducing the financial barrier, at the same time establishing that what we're offering the patient and family has real value. And I think that it's important for the, the patients and families and maybe non-medical people who are watching this to realize that this is not a therapy that's going to be available next year, the year after that. There, we're still very much in the research phase of this. So I think bringing it to the bedside probably a little early to be talking about that. You know, I, I think you're right. It's not going to be next month or next year, but we all tend to overestimate the impact in the short term and underestimate the impact in the long term. The only question here is what's short term and what's long term. Mm -hmm. With the tremendous growth of microfabrication facilities and GMP certified uh, environments, uh, the exploration of Microsensors, microstimulators is proceeding pretty rapidly in many different phases of medicine. So I think that the uh, proliferation, uh, the uh, commercialization, and if you will, the democratization of this type of care isn't as far off as we might think. Mm. All right. Any other significant uh, points about this that we need to let everyone know about before we have run out of time for this segment? <laughs> Gosh, we could talk for hours on the importance <laughs> sure. of this. But I think that, that the key point is that, as Vannevar Bush remarked uh, at the close of the Second World War, science truly is an endless frontier. And the idea that we could explore signal traffic on the vagus nerve, pretty much inconceivable just a decade or two ago. What we're seeing, the advances of technology, science, industry, all feeding into our caregivers at the bedside, enabling them to do new care, better care. And that's really what this is about. It's about delivering the best care today and better care tomorrow. Right? You can't say it much better than that. <laughs> it's a great um, ending line. There we go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Buckman, for your insights and obviously lively discussion. We look so much more to hearing from you in the future. And stay with us. We have uh, two hours that will be devoted to one of the hottest topics in critical care, sepsis and quality improvement.